the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Good evening. Thanks for being here, and thank you. Lots to share with you tonight, uh, starting with the theologian and author, for, author, Father Robert Barron, will be here to discuss his new 10-part series, Catholicism, a heart or a journey to the heart of the faith. It's a sweeping look at Catholic history and the people in the church. It's fascinating. We'll talk about it a little later. We'll also cover uh, some interesting and infuriating stories in the news this week. And here's where you come in. I built some extra time in so we can take more of your calls and emails. Some of you have been writing upset that we don't get to your questions. Well, tonight you can call in about any news item you have a question about, and Father Barron will answer it for you. I'll pitch in if I'm needed. You can give us a ring, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980, or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. Let's begin. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. An historic election, a repudiation of President Barack Obama, whatever you call it, little known pro-life retired Catholic businessman Bob Turner is the newest member of Congress representing Brooklyn and Queens. Turner defeated State Assemblyman David Welprin 53 to 47 percent in Tuesday's special election to replace Democrat Anthony Weiner. It is the first time a Republican has represented the heavily Democratic district since the 1920s. Turner capitalized on discontent in the district's Jewish community over President Obama's handling of the Middle East peace process and general discontent. Turner was one of two Republicans elected to the U.S. House on Tuesday. He and Nevada's Mark Amoday were sworn in Thursday on Capitol Hill. And the Palestinian Authority said it will likely continue its push for statehood at the United Nations. Palestinian Foreign Minister Raid al-Maliki said an official request for full UN membership could come on September 23rd in spite of U.S. diplomatic efforts asking that they not push for a vote. Certain to set back Middle East peace talks, Israel has additionally threatened harsh and grave consequences if the bid goes forward. The statehood bid would in all likelihood be vetoed by the United States in a vote at the Security Council. With a likely stalemate, a compromise being bandied about would instead allow a general assembly vote, giving the Palestinian Authority a status equal to that of the Holy See. That vote is to likely pass, according to UN watchers. The Holy See fully participates as a permanent observer to the UN, lacking only the privilege of voting. Diplomatic talks continue, and we'll keep you posted. And the U.S. State Department warned Tuesday that the so-called Arab Spring is creating an environment of religious intolerance and violence. The warning is contained in the latest International Religious Freedom Report released annually to Congress. Announcing the report, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said the transitions to democracy in the Middle East and North Africa have inspired the world, but they've also exposed ethnic and religious minorities to new dangers. She went on to note that nine people have been killed by their own neighbors because of ethnicity or faith. This year's top offenders for religious freedom, listed as countries of particular concern, are Saudi Arabia, North Korea, Sudan, Uzbekistan, Eritrea, Burma, Iran, and China. In a related story, in spite of persecution, strict government oversight and its aggressive campaign to curb religious influence, Christianity is burgeoning in China. According to a BBC report this week, there's a deep spiritual hunger in that country, which is driving the explosive growth of Christianity there. Official government estimates put the total number of Christians at about 25 million, 6 million Catholic, 18 million Protestant. But that total only recognizes Christians who are members of government-sanctioned churches. 
such as the Catholic Patriotic Association. However, independent estimates peg the number of Christians conservatively at 60 million in China. Unofficial Protestant house churches, as they are called, and the underground Catholic Church account for the difference. Or as the BBC put it, there are already more Chinese at church on any Sunday than in the whole of Europe. And self-described abuse victims group SNAP is again attempting to escalate its fight against the Catholic Church over the clerical abuse of children. On Tuesday, the U.S.-based group was at the Hague asking the International Criminal Court to investigate Pope Benedict and leading cardinals at the Vatican for crimes against humanity. The Vatican's attorney in the U.S. called the effort ludicrous. Lawyers familiar with the court say a Vatican case is not likely to be taken up as it does not meet the ICC mandate to prosecute war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. SNAP nevertheless has insisted that holding the Pope responsible for these crimes at the ICC is not a publicity stunt. SNAP enlisted the New York-based Center for Constitutional Rights to request their inquiry on their behalf. Their list of clients includes the Guantanamo Bay detainees. More on this later in the show. And this past week, Pope Benedict XVI welcomed the United Kingdom's new envoy to the Holy See, Nigel Marcus Baker. The Pope described relations between the Holy See and the UK as excellent in his address to the new ambassador. During their meeting at the Pope's summer residence in Castel Gandolfo, the Pope commended the Queen's recent visit to Northern Ireland as an important milestone in the process of reconciliation despite the unrest there this past summer. And he also emphasized the importance of government policies based on enduring objective values, saying when they do not, moral relativism reigns, which ultimately leads to frustration, despair, selfishness, and a disregard for the life and liberty of others. The need for moral guidance is clear, he continued, referencing the urban riots that terrorized several English cities in August. And the Vatican has offered terms of reconciliation to the traditionalist breakaway group, the Society of St. Pius X. At a Wednesday meeting in Rome, Cardinal William Leveda, prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, asked the society delegation led by Bishop Bernard Fillet to endorse a statement accepting the central teachings of Vatican II. The Vatican did not reveal the details of the document, which was identified as a doctrine preamble. Father Federico Lombardi, the Holy See spokesman, said, if the society accepts the document, the Vatican would then grant canonical recognition to the traditionalist group, most likely in the form of a personal prelature. The leaders of the Society of Pius X are currently suspended from ministry, and the Vatican does not recognize their pastoral authority. The Holy See is hoping for an answer within a few months. And Father Frank Pavone, longtime head of the pro-life group Priest for Life and host of EWTN's Defending Life, has been called home by the Bishop of Amarillo, his bishop, for what the bishop describes as deep concerns over Priest for Life's stewardship of millions of dollars in donations and Father Pavone's alleged resistance to ecclesiastical authority. In a strongly worded letter sent to all the American bishops, Bishop Patrick Zurich revealed that Father Pavone can no longer practice his widely followed pro-life ministry anywhere outside of his Texas diocese. He further encouraged his fellow bishops to inform the faithful not to donate to Priests for Life until the issues and concerns are settled. Since the story became public, Father Pavone has submitted to the bishop's directive and returned to Amarillo. The bishop is away, traveling for two weeks, apparently. The Diocese of Amarillo has made it clear that Father Pavone remains a priest in good standing and that his faculties have not been revoked. For his part, Father Pavone has appealed his bishop's decision directly to the Vatican. He's also forwarded all the requested financial records, including Priest for Life's last audit, to the bishop. He asserts that the finances and stewardship of Priest for Life are, quote, above reproach, and that he's very perplexed by the actions of Bishop Zurich. We'll keep following this story. And finally, 
if fish and chips weren't popular enough in Great Britain, Meatless Fridays are back in for faithful in England and Wales. The bishops there have reinstituted the practice, which has been around since the time of the apostles, after a 26-year absence there. In a statement, the bishops reminded the faithful that every Friday is a special day of penance, for it is the day of the death of our Lord. Quote, many the statement continues, may wish to go beyond this simple act of common witness and mark each Friday with a time of prayer and further self-sacrifice. The bishops chose September 16th, the anniversary of the start of Pope Benedict's visit to the UK to reestablish the practice. And of the I Zing, America's cultural decline from muffin tops to body shots, my recent collaboration with Laura Ingram is still available. It is a fun read, a great way to examine the culture, even the horrible edges. This picture was sent to me by a viewer this week. It is purportedly a Halloween costume intended for five-year-olds. To me, it's everything that's wrong with the culture. Grown women now want to look like teenagers, and apparently they want their tots to look like grown women. This gives new meaning to the word prostitutes. Of the I Zing is available at bookstores everywhere. When we return, we'll discuss an uplifting part of the culture, thank God, Father Robert Barron on his new series and book, Catholicism, and he'll take your calls and questions when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. My guest tonight is a multimedia machine. He's a theologian, a blogger, an author, and the creator of a 10-part documentary and companion book entitled Catholicism. It's a sweeping look at the rich heritage of the Catholic faith as it's manifested all over the world. He takes the viewer on a global journey to explore the glory of the faith that claims over a billion followers. Please welcome Father Robert Barron. Father Good Robert, to be with you, thanks for Thank being you. here at long last. Thanks for having now, me on. We're going to get into the series in a moment, okay. um, and it, 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 it's spectacular. I want people to take a good look at it. And, and it's not only the book, which is which is uh, out this week, I guess. Mm -hmm. September 6th, um, it came out. The, the book is out, and there's a DVD set, as well as a whole study guide. So we're going to get into all of this. This Terrific. is This is really quite something. Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity also to ask questions of Father Barron, or you can ask him of me if you'd like. Give us a ring, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S., or internationally, 205-271-2980, or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. We're going to tackle a few issues in the news before we talk about Catholicism. I guess in the macro and in the in the yeah. pages of the book there. The Vatican this week uh, is under fire. SNAP, this group in New York, uh, is charging the Pope with crimes against humanity and wants the International Criminal Court to prosecute him as such. Your thoughts on what this is about? Well, it's ridiculous. I think as you were saying at the intro, it's more like a publicity stunt, really. Yeah. And the, the problem is they're going after precisely the wrong person. If you're really concerned about the protection of children, well, Josef Rossi has done more than anyone in the world, I think you could safely argue, to uh, protect children, both when he was a cardinal and now as pope. And so targeting him is particularly ridiculous. If you're truly interested, not just in embarrassing the Catholic Church, right. but in protecting children. Um, I can't comment really on the you know international law issue and all yeah, that, well, but uh, I just know, think it's publicity well, stuff. From the folks I've talked to, the problem is... The Vatican is not a signatory to the International yeah. Criminal Court, so there's no yeah. jurisdiction there. And secondly, the Pope or the Cardinals would have to have given explicit direction, mm -hmm. go and abuse children, right. for him to be yeah. uh, uh, you prosecuted, know, under, that and prosecuted under this. Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's, and it's, the people who are involved in this thing for a long time have said the person in the Vatican who most got it was Josef Ratzinger. Right. Talk to people who over the past 10 years or so have looked into this very seriously. Mm -hmm. He's the one most of all who got it. So going after him mm -hmm. strikes me as utterly counterproductive. Presidential season is off and running. The Republicans are fighting it out to see who's going to be at the top of the heap. Rick Perry was here in Virginia, nearby where mm -hmm. we are, yeah. um, this week, and he gave a very impassioned speech about his faith. I want to play a little clip of that and get your reaction and talk about the role okay. of faith this election year. Take a look. 
What I learned as I wrestled with God is that I didn't have to have all the answers, that they would be revealed to me in due time, and that I needed to trust Him. My faith journey is not the story of someone who turned to God because I wanted to. It was because I had nowhere else to turn. I was 27. I'd been an officer in the United States Air Force commanding a fairly substantial piece of sophisticated equipment telling men and women what to do. But I was lost, spiritually and emotionally. And I didn't know how to fix it. We each have a desire to live lives of happiness and fulfillment and consequence. While this world tells us happiness comes from what we can get, I believe it comes in what we can give. Our blessings are never fully realized until we give them away and we share them with others. As spiritual beings, we are meant to live in relationship with our Creator and with one another. And the happiest moments I've ever experienced are when I am in communion with God and in community with others. What do you make, Father, what do you make of this? Uh, when, when some look at that, and I've been reading some of the commentary, they say this is just a political trick. He is trying to appeal to evan his evangelical base. What do you see here? I mean, one answer is then don't vote for him. I mean, it's a free country. Mm -hmm. If you don't like that, don't vote for him. Mm -hmm. But I don't see one little thing wrong with articulating that uh, spiritual vision. I would say probably most of our presidents, from George Washington on, might have right. said something similar about their own yeah. spirituality. Um, and I think it's very healthy in a democracy to have people who acknowledge clearly a certain primacy to God, to the objective uh, ground of justice. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important thing in a democracy. And I wouldn't have one little problem with that articulation of his faith. Look at um, uh, Abraham Lincoln in the Second Inaugural yeah. Address, who speaks in very biblical language, using all sorts of the cadences and tonalities of the Bible. Yeah. I was down today at the uh, King Monument. I wanted to see it yeah. just open. And, uh, you know, his I Have a Dream speech is redolent uh, with the Bible. And so I have no quarrel with people in a public setting using the language of spirituality and faith. The problem is if you want to use the government in a coercive way to mm -hmm. force people into your religious perspective. Right. He's not saying that at all. It seems to me that's the first time I've heard that statement. But yeah. he's doing nothing significantly different than what Lincoln did yeah. in uh, 1865 and what uh, King did in 1963. No, no, I agree with you. I think it's instructive for the, the voter and the public at large yeah. to see what's happening inside of this man. Because yeah. the fact is, with, at that level of responsibility, his deeply held beliefs will no doubt shape his public policy pronouncements and actions, Absolutely. as we've seen in recent years. Yeah, and again, if you don't like it, don't vote for him. Yeah. You know, it's a free country. Yeah. But, I mean, to preclude that kind of discourse uh, automatically strikes me as, uh, as counterindicated. No, I think it's a healthy, it's a healthy beginning. And yeah. uh, a part of this, no doubt, also the politically canny in town, tell me, um, is to smoke out the other candidates and uh, encourage them or maybe force them to have a discussion about faith that maybe they are or aren't prepared to have at this time. Yeah, you know, maybe that's all to the good. I, yeah. mean, I think that sort of, uh, of candor about it is perfectly mm -hmm. fine. And if it does compel people to say something similar about their own spiritual yeah. formation and belief, yeah. fine. That's healthy in democracy. One more topic I wanted to cover, and then we'll get back to news a little later. Yeah. Uh, this bishop in Ireland, a retired bishop, uh, Edward Daly, uh, he has written a new book and made a big splash. I saw him on CNN the mm -hmm. other day. He is claiming that it's time for the church to be done with celibacy yeah. in the priesthood and to have married clergy. We already have married clergy in the Eastern Church, yes? We do, yeah. And we had married clergy for a long time, obviously, yeah. in the Western Church. It's not essentially tied to the priesthood mm -hmm. and celibacy. But, no, I wouldn't uh, subscribe to that. Some people make this easy connection between celibacy, the sex abuse scandal, our current problems. And there's really nothing to justify that. In fact, just the contrary. Um, and I think... There's a very powerful witness value to celibacy. Within this world that is often so obsessed with, uh, with pleasure and with sex, to witness to a way of love that's characteristic of heaven. So I, I would put mm -hmm. celibacy very much in that theological, eschatological context. 
it does have a practical advantage. I see that as a priest. I've been a priest for 25 years. There is a practical advantage to celibacy. It gives you a certain freedom and ranginess mm -hmm. and so on in the ministry. But its primary value is eschatological. It witnesses to a way of loving that transcends the ordinary way of love of the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's a sign. It's an enormously powerful sign value. And I would be loath to see that uh, disappear. Yeah, he's claiming this will do away with the church's problems. It seems to me it would create more problems. Yeah, and of course that's demonstrably false. I mean, look at lots of other churches that have uh, married clergy, and these problems do not even s miraculously. You know, no. so that's just um, obviously false. I think. Yeah. Let's move back to something a bit more positive and uplifting. <laughs> uh, Father has created a brand new. 10-part DVD series, as well as a new book, and a, it's really an approach to understanding the church called Catholicism. Look at this trailer. The church is going through a dark period. The church is under fire, it's under attack. The Catholic story is being told, but being told by the wrong people in the wrong way. We need to tell our own story. We need to get the message out so as to draw people in. Catholicism is smart. Catholicism is beautiful. Catholicism is colorful. It's textured. It engages the mind and the heart and the body. Christianity always has an explosive power. If we let it be itself, it always has this transformative power. How do you find joy? The sure sign that God is alive in you is joy. I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. That's what Jesus said. Catholicism at its heart is not a no, it's a yes. In fact, it's the story of the whole world. It's your story. That's Catholicism, a little trailer there, a little taste. Uh, Father Barron, of course, is the creator and host of uh, this series. Uh, what is the goal here? Why spend so much time making this comprehensive 10-part series and book? I'll give a little background. Uh, Cardinal Francis George, who's my boss in mm -hmm. Chicago, went to Rome for an ad limina visit with Pope John Paul II, mm -hmm. toward the end of John Paul's life. And he reported on the diocese and so on. Then the Pope said to him, what are you doing to evangelize the culture? And Cardinal George, who's rarely at a loss for words, said he didn't quite know what to say. And it bothered him. So he took me aside one day at the seminary, not long after, and he said, I want you to jumpstart evangelization. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, I want you to work on this evangelization of the culture. Hmm. So I began, you know, with radio and some um, public lectures and so on. But I said, Your Eminence, if we really want to reach the culture, we got to use the media. Mm -hmm. And so DVDs and that sort of thing. But this was my dream project, was hmm. to do something that would really display Catholicism in its truth and its beauty. Because we're a theologically rich religion and we're also such a beautiful visual religion. And one of the inspirations too was um, Kenneth Clark. If you remember that program from the 1970s, sure, Civilization. Civilization. Yeah. When I was a kid, that had a huge impact on me. Mm -hmm. This uh, brilliant, he was the head of the uh, uh, National Gallery in London. Right. Went all over Europe to the cathedrals and the, and the museums and showed the paintings and all this mm -hmm. to exemplify and to really praise and celebrate Western civilization. For a long time, I thought, why not something similar about Catholicism? Because mm -hmm. we can do what Clark did with Western civilization. We can talk about it and we can show it. Right. So I had a dream about that and I told my board members about it. And one of the board members said, you should drop everything you're doing and do that. And so that's how it got started. And my, my goal really is what the Cardinal wants, what I think John Paul II wanted, yeah. to reach out to the culture and to proclaim Jesus Christ mm. to it. How long did it take you to, to get this? This is a, I, I can tell just watching, 
this is a horribly <laughs> large, <laughs> yeah. expansive use of time, yeah. energy, and money. Well, you know, one thing about the time is uh, I said to my board when they said, we, you know, you should do this. I said, well, first we got to find out from Cardinal George if I can. Mm -hmm. So some of the board members went down to see him. I didn't go. They went and said, mm -hmm. we'd like him to do this. And he said, whatever I need to do, I'll do. So I had his backing. Uh, he gave me the time. Mm -hmm. Then we had to raise about $3 million. Wow. <laughs> so to get the 10 parts finished. And we work with a wonderful group called Picture Show mm -hmm. that's led by Mike Leonard. Mm -hmm. Mike is a Today Show correspondent. He's been mm -hmm. there for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I knew him in the parish I helped out at on Sunday. Ah. Mike was there. We began talking, and his group, Picture Show, uh, does video production. So I said, mm -hmm. could you take on a project like this, going all over the world? He said, yeah. And so we started plotting and planning and raising the money. When we got the requisite money for the first episode, I said, let's go. And we went to the Holy Land and we uh, started filming. Then for the next three years, we begged and begged and prayed and prayed. Mm -hmm. And as the money would come in, I'd say, let's go, another trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, the economy collapsed halfway through our fundraising. Oh, boy. <laughs> so we had to stop and start a few times, but we eventually went to 16 countries. And um, I have a wonderful team that, uh, that work with me, and we eventually produced this 10-part series. There have been many examinations of the history of the church, both in, in print and in video. What sets this apart, and why did you feel you needed to do it now? Yeah. Aside from the John Paul II evangelizing the culture yeah, imperative. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of it. But I think what sets it apart is a thematic approach. It's not really mm -hmm. a historical approach, though mm -hmm. a lot of history is in it. Not really a cultural approach, though a lot of culture is in it. It's a mm -hmm. thematic approach. Mm -hmm. So I look at Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, God, Mary, the saints, the last things, um, prayer, spirituality, mm -hmm. 10 great themes. And then I wanted with each one to talk about them and then to show them. So when I would do the script, I think, now, where would I go in the world to show this motif? Whether it's mm -hmm. Mary's importance, whether it's Peter and Paul, whether it's the last things. And that was part of the fun of it was like, where can we go? Anywhere in the yeah. Catholic world. Um, so I think that's what makes it different is it's thematic and it's, it's um, global and it's, uh, it's visual. You know, it's the, the beauty comes to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Another, to your second question, Yes, to evangelize the culture, but also I'm responding to this time we're going through, which I've characterized as the worst period in American Catholic Church history. Mm -hmm. You know, the sex abuse scandal is worse than the 19th century when they're burning down convents. I mean, I think this yeah. is the time when the church is suffering the most. Mm -hmm. So what do you do at a time like this? And looking back at the history of the church, it seems to me during times of crisis, the great figures came forward mm -hmm. with a sort of back to basics evangelicalism, whether that's Benedict, you know, at the time of the collapse of the empire, whether it's uh, Francis and Dominic during a time of great yeah. clerical corruption, whether it's um, Ignatius during the Reformation. Now, I, I'm not a saint, but I'm trying to imitate them, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time to come forward with this sort of, what are we about? What is the Catholic Church about? Because, mm -hmm. yes, we have to address the sex abuse scandal, obviously, but I'm loath to see the Church reduced to the sex abuse scandal. Yeah. The 2,000 years of art and saints and the liturgy and theology and spirituality is reduced to that. Um, so I wanted this to uh, inspire Catholics, remind them of their rich heritage, and also to draw people in. You mm -hmm. know, maybe those who've fallen away from the faith, maybe secularists, non-believers. Because th th there is a danger today. I mean, you touched on it a moment ago. The perception of the church in the pop culture is pedophiles and corruption. I know. How do you counter that? Yeah, I think, well, you know, when they, uh, to the point of corruption, I do um, uh, little commentaries I put on YouTube. Yep. And one a long time ago I did on corruption in business or something. And, and the word corruption was in the title of the little YouTube mm -hmm. piece. Well, people can comment, of course. One of the comments was, well, isn't this ironic? Because who could be more corrupt than a Catholic priest? <laughs> I mean, there, there's this, as you say, this weird perception. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you do? I think you show it. I think you remind people of what is the substance of the faith. Um, you remind them of this great heritage in theology, art, architecture, spirituality. Above all the saints, what runs through this series, uh, in the book as well, are a lot of stories of the great saints. Uh, John Paul II, a great hero of mine, comes up prominently in the book. But we go through all sorts of saints who exemplify what the church is about, which is making people holy. Mm -hmm. So that's been my strategy, is to show it, remind people. We have an email that just came in. This is from um, Elena, and she writes, I'm a theology teacher at a Catholic high school. Do you think the new series would be appropriate for their age group? Yeah, I think so. Maybe especially the upper level. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's not a hyper academic approach, but it's not dumbed down because I've, yeah. I'm it's on medium. a great crusade against dumbed mm -hmm. down Catholicism, which my generation got. And I expected a lot of cut shots and uh, talking heads and you'd interview people here and there. You, you know, don't do that really. No, D I, Discuss the approach. Tell people the approach. Well, I followed the Kenneth Clark approach where it was one figure, one voice kind of mm -hmm. leading you through. And I wanted the intelligence of our tradition to come through. I didn't mm -hmm. want it just to be a whiz bang sort of, yeah. you know, MTV sort of approach. So I wanted it to be serious. Not academic, not yeah. hyper-technical, but serious. For example, in episode three on God, I go to Santa Sabina in Rome, where mm -hmm. Thomas Aquinas wrote the mm -hmm. Summa. And there's a courtyard there that Thomas would have known in the 1260s. And I walk around that courtyard as I develop one of his arguments for God's existence. So I want that intelligence to come through. But no, I'd be very happy to see high school students use it. We have a program that goes with it that would allow an RCIA group, an adult formation group, or a high school mm -hmm. or college classroom yeah. to move through it. Well, I, what I loved is it's all, it, it's not only, not only do you get rich theology between the, this beautiful travelogue of all yeah. of Catholicism, and, and, and these are nooks and crannies that most people will never see in the yeah. flesh in their real lives, and, yeah. and uh, it's a real treat to, to see it here. And, in, uh, in blazing color, and the music is beautiful. It's really well done. We'll talk more about Catholicism. We'll also get to your calls when the world of our life continues. Father Robert Barron stays with us, and you will too, I hope. See you on the other side of this break. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. I agree with uh, Godfrey Diekman, who is a, um, actually a figure at Vatican II. He's an American Benedictine. He said the thing we lost sight of after the council was the idea of the mystical body. And prior to the council, lots of the leading theologians had a lot to say about it. And that's why from the mass comes social justice. Social justice returns to the mass. Those two are always linked. Those two are always linked. And that is Father Robert Barron, my guest tonight on The World Over, and he's back talking about his latest project, Catholicism, A Journey to the Heart of the Faith. And that was a little clip from this exquisite 10-part series that uh, will be making its premiere in November on PBS. And then EWTN will be broadcasting a number of the yeah. episodes. So it's uh, quite exciting. Yeah, we're delighted about that. L let's talk about the way you do tackle some of the black legends in the dark corners of the church as well. How do you deal with that? How do you put those in perspective? Here? Yeah, we have an episode on the church. And I mm -hmm. talk about the church as one holy Catholic and apostolic. So you get to the holiness of the church, and then the obvious objections arise about the Inquisition, mm -hmm. the Crusades, et cetera, et cetera. Or bring it up to today, the sex abuse scandal. How could a church that has either countenanced or participated in these things be holy? And I make the case that, you know, even churchmen of the highest rank have sometimes done things that are less than holy. It doesn't compromise the essential holiness of the church, mm -hmm. which is a matter of the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, the saints, the authoritative teaching of the church, etc. We hold the treasure in earthen vessels, as Paul said. Mm -hmm. And so the, the corruption of certain people and certain activities within the history of the church doesn't... Uh, compromise the essential holiness of the church. So I tried just to make that simple, but I think important point. Um, but that distinction often is not made. Uh, yeah, no, so that's, that's the way I, I approach that one. Yeah, no, the people get hung up on these things. In fact, I, there was someone I encountered this past week whose name I will not reveal, um, <laughs> who said that he could not understand how an all-loving God could possibly allow, and you get into this in, your, um, in the mm -hmm. chapter on the problem of evil in the yeah. book, yeah. How could an all-loving God permit a child to die of terrible disease, whole villages to be wiped out randomly, radically, or anyone to go to hell at all? Mm -hmm. How could a loving God do that? What would yeah. you say to them? Well, of course, it's one of the classic issues in theology, mm -hmm. theodicy, how to justify right. God's uh, activity in the presence of evil. The standard answer, going back to Augustine, that God doesn't cause evil, but God permits certain evils to bring about a greater good. And I still don't think there's any better answer to the question. It's the hardest question. It's the only really serious objection to God's existence, I think. But I don't know a better answer to it than that. We can't say that God uh, produces evil, because evil is a type of non-being. And God is being itself. But God permits certain evils. And we can sometimes, of course, see that in ordinary experience, where certain things that we perceive as evil, mm -hmm. in fact, have conduced toward great goods, which would never have come otherwise. So we can sometimes see it. Now, in the case of God, we have to invoke the widest possible horizon. God is an artist, Aquinas says, whose canvas is all of space and all of time. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. What do we see of it? But I mean, one tiny little corner. Yeah. God's canvas is all of space and all of time. So this doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah, you're looking at this one little bit of the canvas, mm. God who sees the whole. Which is why in the, in the series, in the book, I use the great Seurat painting. Right, uh, of the in Grand Chicago. Chat, which is in Chicago, yeah. yeah, and we got permission to film right there. But Seurat, of course, applied, he's a pointillist stylist, mm -hmm. applied individual dots of color. Mm. If you have your face pressed against the picture, you'll just see a few, you know, little splotches. Little splotches. Yeah. As you step back from it, you get ever wider horizons of, of meaning and perspective. Well, then the figures emerge, then groups emerge, mm -hmm. and finally the whole picture in all of its beauty, but made up of this play of light and dark. Yeah. Now, is that a perfect answer to the problem? No, but it yeah. provides some perspective. But what God the artist is doing is applying lights and darks, you know, permitting yeah. darkness, but it's contributing to this overall picture. Um, completely adequate explanation, no but an important perspective on it, I'd say mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, it's you know? a mystery in the end. It is, but, it's a, it, but we have a certain confidence in the goodness of God and that God is about a positive purpose. We know that. Now the details of it, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's beyond us. Precisely what's going on, I, don't, I can't tell. Yeah. But that something good is going on. Yes, we have to maintain that. I promised we'd take a few calls. Barb from Michigan. Go ahead, Barb, what's your question? Yes, Raven Father. Quick question: Can the priest, can the pope ever change the self selflessly rule on the priest, and can the pope ever change as far as women becoming priests? Because we're getting conflicting messages from our parishes in state of Michigan. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, and there's in some ways a simple answer to that question: Yes to the first, no to the second. I mean, it is possible for that discipline to change. So for a long time, we didn't have the discipline of celibacy mm -hmm. in the Western Church. Then it became the universal discipline. So yeah, that can change. We don't recognize it as belonging essentially to the nature of priesthood. In the case of women priests, though, as John Paul II was so careful to point out, it does belong to the deposit of the faith. It does belong to the very nature of the priesthood that it's um, exercised only by men. So the answer to the first is yes, to the second is no. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an important distinction. You know, even as I defend celibacy, as I do, I don't want that sure. to change. It could, in principle, change. Right. The Pope has the, has the option. And yeah. it, is a, it is a discipline It's a discipline that could change. And in the Eastern Church, you see yeah, where there right. is a celibate priesthood and then there are non-celibates. That's right. Yeah. You know, the bishops, and from the non-celibates, the bishops are chosen uh -huh. yeah, in the East. Uh, so sure, that could change in principle. I notice in the chapter in this book, on, it's called The Vast Company of Witnesses. Mm -hmm. There are no men in the yeah. vast company of witnesses. Why is that? That's on purpose. Couldn't find a holy guy in the whole group? No, there are a lot of them. But it's that steady complaint, you see hear it all the time, that somehow the church is um, oppressive toward women mm -hmm. by excluding women from uh, the priesthood. Uh -huh. So this was and, a choice on your no, part. No, it, it was. Yeah. And, and the idea was what the church is about is producing saints. That's the whole raison d'etre of the church. Everything the church mm -hmm. is about is to make people holy. If the church were to say, you can't be a saint, then we're in a problematic situation. Then we're in a basic injustice. What I would say to a woman who might feel oppressed by the church or I'm excluded from power structures or whatever it is, is no, you can, you can start being a saint today. And that's what matters. What I do as a priest, simply stated is, I try to help people become saints. That's my whole purpose as a priest. That's the mm -hmm. purpose of the sacraments, the purpose of the liturgy. You know. And so I, I wanted to highlight the fact that we have these wonderful examples of extremely powerful women, not in the sort of institutional sense necessarily, but in the spiritual sense. So by taking Catherine Drexel and taking the little flower and Edith Stein um, uh, to show this enormous unleashing of power, which comes mm. from being holy. Right. So that was a, a purposeful choice just to highlight that's where the power is. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, you know, a lot of us are, are obsessed with institutional power as though that's where it's at. Mm -hmm. Where it's at is spiritual power. I think too, you know, Thomas Aquinas' sister famously said to him, what must I do to be a saint? He said, will it, want it, you know, desire mm -hmm. it. Part of the problem is we accept a sort of spiritual mediocrity. And I want to say that's where the conversation should shift is toward how do I become a saint? That's all that yeah. matters. Yeah. Um, who are the most powerful women in the church in the 19th century? I mean, I'd say Bernadette of Lourdes and the Little Flower. All right. Who's the most powerful Catholic of the 20th century? And I, who reverence John Paul II, I'd say Mother Teresa, the most powerful wow. figure. 
You I'd know, say Mother Angelica. Mother you, but, no, 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 Mama. I'm, I'm, I got your back, Mother Angelica. Don't worry about it. But the point is, and when, we wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for Mother no, Angelica. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll raise you one. It's all right. Go ahead, Mother Teresa, Mother Angelica. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, is that their holiness is what unleashes power. Yeah. You know, so um, I think a shifting of the conversation along those lines is a good thing. Uh -huh. I agree. Let's go to the phones. Uh, Walter, what's your question, Walter? Uh, Father, what happened to our beautiful tradition? and our reverence in our Catholic Church. And I would just like to say, blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, Walter, thank you. <laughs> well, I agree with you. I mean, reverence is a very important thing. And I think, you know, my generation took in a, a fair amount of that, a certain irreverence, I suppose. And, uh, you know, the, the way we approach the Blessed Sacrament, the way even that we enter the church uh, building, you know, with a sense of reverence is important because you're, you're passing through a sort of liminal state from the ordinary world mm -hmm. into this world that's meant to evoke heaven. And part of that is embodied in practices. There I'm with Cardinal George very much where he says a dogma or a doctrine has to be protected by practices. For mm -hmm. example, the dogma of the real presence. It's a dogma of the church. It always has been. But what protects it would be certain gestures and practices that reflect it, that respect it. There's the bow, the genuflection, the right. way the priest handles the Eucharistic elements, etc. Mm -hmm. Those disciplines matter because right. if they fade away, what can happen is the doctrine begins to fade away. People don't right. know it anymore. So I do think reverence is a very important thing. Um, yeah. Not a fussy, you know, a piety, let's say, but a, a, a strong, mature sense of reverence for God and the things of God, right. I think, is indispensable. Now, somewhere in the book, you, you talk about the, the power of the liturgy and that to the outside world, this is foolish. Yeah. Well, I make ritual. The, yeah, I make the point that the very uselessness of the liturgy is mm -hmm. the point. In a certain mm -hmm. way, Aristotle said, the highest things are the most useless things because they're sought only for their own sake. Something that's useful. So I'm going to uh, sip on that water so my, my you know, throat is cleared. It's a, it's a useful thing to do. Right. But useless things, like playing baseball. You play baseball because it's beautiful so to do. You watch... Uh, golf for the same reason. It's not really useful. It's a useless thing to do mm -hmm. to spend four hours watching golf. That's because it's beautiful to watch golf. Well, see, the liturgy is the most useless thing of all because mm -hmm. it's the praise of God. That means it's the highest thing of all. You know, it's the anticipation of the uselessness of heaven. Mm -hmm. Heaven's not a useful place. It's a useless place where we are totally lost in the praise of God. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the liturgy. It's yeah. uh, it's not subordinated to an end outside of itself. It's its own beautiful uh, end in mm -hmm. itself. I want to go to this email because it's interesting. Uh, this this uh, Paul writes that he's a huge fan of Word on Fire, which is your yeah, uh, you. your portal, and yeah. uh, you have videos there and blog postings, etc. Film yeah. reviews, yeah. Um, and it is a tremendous effect on the church. One nagging issue for me is the question of the reliability of the Gospels. Paul writes, huh. the entire C.S. Lewis Lord liar lunatic argument rests on the Gospels being credible documents, so that the resurrection isn't an evolution legend. With people like Bart Ehrman insisting that the yeah. New Testament documents were largely changed over time and are unreliable, how do we get comfortable that the Gospels are truly credible? Any book recommendations on this topic? Boy, Paul, sir. That's a lot. No, that's, question. It's good, though, and I think Bart Ehrman's stuff is, is, uh, is very problematic because what he's doing is simply rehearsing some commonplaces of um, you know, biblical analysis, that there are some of these anomalies. They're often in very minor uh, issues, very uh, slight textual deviations, so on. It's been recognized forever. I mean, even right. by the ancient and medieval scholars. Um, C.S. Lewis said, anyone that thinks the Gospels are myths has never read many myths. And that's a very good point. Think of like a Star Wars as a myth, yeah. you know, because it's set in a galaxy far, far away, long, long time ago, like once upon a time. Because a myth is a sort of archetypal presentation of basic truths about nature and life. It's not an historical uh, document. When you say in the Gospels, for example, that Jesus is born, you know, when Caesar Augustus is emperor of Rome, when Quirinius is governor of, of uh, Syria, that he's crucified under Pontius Pilate, see, that matters. What they're saying is this is not a mythic statement. Mm -hmm. This is an historical claim. And see, we have more reliable historical information about Jesus than almost any other ancient figure. All right. When you look at the, the wealth of evidence we have and the texts that go back so far and are so consistent, we have more reliable evidence about him than about any other figure, almost any other figure in the yeah. ancient world. So the claim that somehow the uh, Gospels are tissues of, of lies and myths and legends, mm -hmm. that's just crazy. 
Why do you think the church has abdicated its traditional role as a patron of the arts? Because it seems to me one of the emphasis here in, yeah. the, in the series is the sense of beauty yeah. and the contributions, the patrimony of the church to the world of art. Yeah. You know, it's a complicated question, but I addressed it the other night. I gave the John Carroll lecture here in Washington, mm -hmm. and I talked about that a little bit. Uh, much of modern art is predicated upon a certain move to subjectivity, that the purpose of the artist is not so much to imitate the forms of nature, imitating God the artist, but now to express his own or her own creativity. Well, that's a, that's a major shift. In classical art and medieval art, and in the Christian reflection upon it, God is, is recognized as the chief artist. What the artist here below does is he or she would imitate those forms and then try to produce something beautiful in imitation of God's primordial right. work of art. Well, see, that's creator. what informed, I would argue, Dante, Michelangelo, Bernini, Mozart, sure, Palestrina, did, yeah. is that they were operating out of that um, uh, context. When it shifts to a kind of a pure expressionism, well, then the church and art part ways, and that has been a tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, I'm trying to recover that here is to show forth this and to encourage a new generation of artists mm -hmm. uh, to, to do, you know, the work of the church in a certain way to evangelize through the arts. Um, but I think it's that shift that happened at the rise of modernity that led to some of this uh, mm -hmm. rupture. No, it's a, a self-expression, and now we're into regurgitative art, where we simply take things that worked 20 years ago, 30 yeah. years ago, 40 years ago, and just repackage well, it, put new people in it, and there you are. There's an analog, too, I think, to much of uh, modernity's sense of uh, morality. Morality simply is self-expression, mm -hmm. not a conforming one's life to a certain objective ideal right. and to a certain objective norm grounded in God, which, you know, that governed Western thought from the ancient times through mm -hmm. modern times. But now it's simply morality is self-expression. So it's a moral correlate to that artistic uh, judgment that, that the purpose is for the artist to express him or herself. Mm -hmm. I think we have to recover the objectivity of the forms and also of God as artist, which is a major motif in Thomas Aquinas. I want to go to the phones. Jack from Pennsylvania, what's your question? Uh, thank you for taking my phone call, Father and Raymond. Uh, real quick, a couple of minutes ago, Father mentioned, he said that the actions of certain individuals don't compromise the essential holiness of the church. And I'm wondering if the church is the mystical body of Christ who is absolutely holy. Why would Father distinguish by using the word essential versus absolute? Good question. Well, yeah, I guess it's, just, it's a matter of terms there. Um, the essential holiness of the church, I think, is embodied in the great treasury of sacraments, especially the Eucharist, in its authoritative teaching, uh, in the lives of the saints, um, you know, in the authority of, of the Pope and bishops and so on, and that's where you find it. And all of that is meant to produce holy people. Now, are there unholy people that operate sometimes under the aegis of the church? Yeah, sometimes even of, of high ecclesiastical rank, sure. But none of that would compromise, that's what I mean by its essential uh, mm -hmm. holiness. And of course, I subscribe very much to the mystical body theology, as I said in that little clip. I think we lost some of that after the council. And that is, the, I think, the best way to look at the church and to understand mm -hmm. it as an organism, not an organization. One of my very probing friends uh, sends an email and she writes, sounds wonderful question. There are a lot of priests in Chicago. Why did the Cardinal turn to you? And what is your academic background? Yeah, I guess you have to ask him why he turned to me. But my academic background is um, I have a master's in philosophy from here, from Catholic University in Washington. Oh. And I studied with some great masters there, including uh, Monsignor Robert Sokolowski, who was one of my great uh, mm -hmm. teachers. Then I uh, uh, went to the seminary in Chicago, worked for a time in a parish, and then I went to Paris, to the Institut Catholique, mm -hmm. and I studied there for my doctorate. And um, I've been teaching, you know, since I got the doctorate. I went to Paris because of Aquinas. It was really his town, and I wanted to study uh, Thomas Aquinas. And I had some ability in French before I went over, and that was attractive mm -hmm. to me. Um, so that's my academic background. How did this project and working on it deepen your faith personally? Oh, gosh. Did it have an impact? Oh, God, in so many ways. I mean, I'm still working that through, really. Mm -hmm. um, as we were doing the series, you know, you're hard at work on it, and you're going yeah. through all the details. But then as you reflect on it, I think of the first trip to the Holy Land. I'd never been there before. Ah. So we arrive in the Holy Land, and I start giving these speeches. But I, I've never prayed the Psalms the same way since. You know, when you think mm -hmm. of the Psalms as the songs of the temple, and there you are on the Temple Mount. Yeah. Um, to go through the Judean desert, uh, overwhelming experience to me. Up in Galilee, one night uh, our Israeli guide said, oh, there's the best place to go. It's kind of a northeast 
of the lake and you get a, a view of the entire thing. And there we were on this gorgeous summer night, the sun's going down, and I could see in one glance the entire Sea of Galilee. Well, that just changes you forever. I mean, because no. there, this is the Jesus land. This These is These hills he knew. Um, the one that had, I think, the biggest emotional impact on me was Namu Gongo, which is just outside of Kampala. Uh, I'd asked all of my African students at Mundelein. We teach a number of guys from Africa. I said, where should I go to show African Catholicism? To a person, they said, Namu Gongo. It's the site where Charles Luanga and his companions were, were killed, mm -hmm. where they burned at the stake. And they said on the Feast of, of the Martyrs, June the 3rd, there's this massive liturgy. So our team went there on June 3rd, and there's the site where Charles Luanga was killed. And it's shaped like, it's a chapel shaped like a funeral pyre, you know. Mm. And then around it are 500,000 people who come, you know, to celebrate wow. this. And the procession of the African dance and then the stately procession of the priests and bishops but I remember what we filmed there was, I just a little short thing. I said, Tertullian claimed the blood of the martyrs is the seed of Christians. Was that true in this case? You tell me. And then the camera pans back and takes in 500,000 people. Mm. Uh, I'm oh. still moved when I think about that. And that deepened my faith enormously, especially to see the, mm -hmm. as everyone's been saying, the church in the South, you know, in Latin America, in Asia, right. especially Africa, is just booming. And to see that faith. Or I think of our trip to Calcutta. I'd never been there. And it was just, it was the most uh, squalid place I'd ever been in my life, yeah. you know, and to see the, the poverty and to see the, the degradation. And then in the midst of it, these young women, as Mother Teresa's sisters, beaming with joy. I mean, that's yeah. just, how can that not change your life yeah, no. to see that? Clearly. They're, so they're, all of that, I mean, just continues to have ramifications for me. You no, know, their joy is infectious and, yeah. and powerful there because of the contrast uh, with the street. Tom, what's your question? Really fast. We're almost out of time. Okay, Raymond, thank you. I wanted to ask, Father, uh, my wife and I are recent converts to the faith, and we wanted to find out how the new film is going to evangelize to new folks who may be believers but maybe not Catholic. Thank you. There it is. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, I think of it in terms of concentric circles. Uh, I'd love to get, I'd love to educate, inspire Catholics who are, you know, in the church. But then I think of the next circle out, I'd love to get... Catholics, and the studies show most who have gone away have not stormed away, they've drifted away, mm -hmm. you know? I want to get the drifted away Catholics, and the studies are showing it's the second largest religion in America, or yep. ex-Catholics. I'd love to, to beguile them, to intrigue them enough to come back. Um, and then, you know, go out further. I want to get the secularists as well, you know? So I think someone who's recently converted to the faith, I think could really benefit from this, and I hope would inspire them and lift them up. Um, mm -hmm. Our little picture there on the cover is, as I entered Saint Chapelle in Paris, yeah, there and, you are, and that was one of my favorite places. See it here better, probably. Yeah, there it is. Is our we filmed the stand up in there? It was early in the morning before the crowds got there, and our cameraman said, "Well, Father, why don't you go outside and just come in the door, and I'll film that." So we got that picture, and then we said, "Well, that's it. That's our picture." Because I'm trying to just open the door to this treasure house, which is mm -hmm. the Catholic thing, in all of its riches and beauty. Yeah, why do you open the book that way? That the Catholic thing, I, 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 that formulation. I've never been a fan of it, but and it, and it's and, and the rest of this book is so filled with history and insight and quotes from the saint. The Catholic thing, eh. It's the Catholic reality. It's the Catholic substance. The Catholic. It's essence. Catholicism. Yeah. No. Right. <laughs> we know, I'm relying there on, on Newman, who's one of my great heroes. Newman has these nine principles of Catholicism, but the fundamental principle is the incarnation. That's the Catholic thing. And it's the church down through the ages is the prolongation of the incarnation. So that's what the book is about, really, is showing you that in oh, all no. of its Well, richness. it's a fantastic uh, journey, and it really is a journey, whether in print or uh, in the DVD. For more on Father Robert Barron and Catholicism, visit catholicismseries.com. You can find out all about the video series, book, and study guide there. EWTN will be airing six episodes of the 10-episode series of Catholicism in November, and some PBS stations will be doing so as well, so check your local listings. In the meantime, it's available online and at bookstores everywhere. Father Barron, thanks My for being pleasure, on Raymond. the show. Thank we you hope you come back. I'd love to. Great, to. great having you here. Before we go, I continue to get such nice email for, about the Truth and Life Audio Bible. It's still available through EWTN's religious catalog. Don't fret. It's the only Catholic dramatized audio Bible available anywhere. World-class actors Stacy Keach, Michael York, John Reese davies and many more bring the gospel to life as never before. And since I produced it, 
I know. Get your copy now. If you go to RaymondArroyo.com, I've got a link to the religious catalog there at the top. And as long as you're there, visit my Facebook and Twitter pages. They're linked on the left-hand side of the site. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye now.